Uh, welcome to our meeting for January 2014. And today's topic is going to deal with uh, backup strategies and how to work with external storage. So uh, good to see you guys out here for what I consider to be a very important topic. Um, it's one that we take, we kind of take for granted now because of time machine, which is a good thing. But at the same time, um, I wouldn't do the meeting if time machine was the only thing we needed to talk about or the only answer or it solved all the problems because it quite frankly doesn't. So how many of you feel that you are 100% safe if some major catastrophe happened to your system, your computer, your iDevices right now, you got home and it was totally dead and you couldn't access the computer, the drives or anything. How many of you feel okay that you'd be okay once you replace the equipment? For a given value of okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. How many of you don't feel like you'd be okay if the equipment died today and you had to replace it? All right. So some brave hands went up earlier. That's good. <laughs> and then some honest hands went up after that and said, no, I don't feel comfortable. Well, I'm going um, to take you back a little bit and give you my first horror story of not being backed up. And it goes way back. It goes back to the days when we got our software in the mail on a CD or a floppy even before that. I walked in. It was a Friday afternoon. I'll never forget it. I walked in the house, grabbed the mail, and there was a disc from Norton Utilities. And it was your latest version update for Nord. I was like, yeah, okay, great. Opened the disc, popped it in my laptop at the time, ran Norton Utilities, which, by the way, for those of you who never use Norton Utilities, don't know what it is, it's a utility that's supposed to check your hard drive, make sure everything's okay, do any repairs if necessary. It's basically for your protection. So I popped this disc in, ran it, um, walked away from the computer, came back, and the progress bar was like halfway, and it wasn't moving, and I kind of just said, okay, well, it's probably in the middle of something, I'll come back later, see if it's moved, come back later, still hasn't moved, go away, do some other stuff, <laughs> come back later, still in the exact same spot, hasn't moved, to where, I don't remember how long I waited, but it was certainly long enough for me to know that it was never going to move. Like it was stopped dead in its tracks. That application was frozen, not moving anymore. So what do I do? Force quit. Not, you know, not happening. Reboot. Flashing question mark. See, what does that mean? That means <laughs> the operating, yeah, right, operating system screwed up, couldn't find anything. And basically, long story short, my data was gone. My drive was hosed. It, and by the way, this drive was working perfectly fine before I opened that disk. No problems, wasn't having any issues. I call myself being proactive and trying to... And oh, and by the way, when I ran it, the first thing that came up was you need to repair something. So yeah, repair it. That's when it got halfway and just froze. So in the middle of whatever it was doing, it screwed up my whole drive. I lost everything that was on it. I immediately jumped in my car, because that's what you had to do back then, ran to a micro center, computer store, whatever it was at the time, I don't remember, grabbed another recovery utility to try and get back some of my data. And I would say back then, I don't know, it might have been an 80, 80 megabyte drive back then or whatever it was. Whatever it was, I got back maybe 10% of it. Just random documents, random things that, you know, wasn't like I was getting back whole folders. I might get back a 10 things in this folder and five things in that folder and two things in this folder, just random stuff. And the reason I had to run out and get a utility to restore things is because I had no backup whatsoever. None. Not an old one. I had none. Because I just never had a problem with my Macs back then. I never, ever, ever thought I would ever lose anything. And that was my first real backup lesson. 
And I have, since that day, <laughs> been backed up ever since. Because once I did the, once I mentally got past, you just lost 95% of everything you had, and I had to start from scratch, install the operating system, rebuild everything from scratch, put all the applications back on, and just put back on whatever documents I could go find. Um, it was months after that that I would be in the middle of something, and I would say, oh, I need to go open up this Word document or this whatever. Oh, I can't. It's gone. Oh, I need this pick. Oh, it's gone. And so it, was, it took months for me to realize just how much I had really lost because I would go to do something that just wasn't there anymore. And that taught me the most valuable computing lesson I had ever had is that if you don't back, basically whatever you're saying you don't back up, you're saying you can afford to lose because one day you will. And it gave me, a, I, I can't remember where this quote came from. I don't think I thought it up myself, but somewhere I heard that there are two types of computer users. Those who are about to lose something and those who have. So either you're about to lose something or you have already lost something and you know the pain. Um, and that was way, way, way before, years before Apple had any kind of backup whatsoever. They didn't have time. It was years before Time Machine. It was even years before the iTools backup application that they had way back then. So if you wanted to back up your computer, you were on your own to go find your own solution, to buy your own software, to figure out how you're going to do it, buy an external drive, and just figure the whole process out. And back then, people were backing up to other things like tape. Um, I think it was before CD-ROM, so it was either tape or an external hard drive. Uh, and a lot of times, people didn't back up then because the equipment was so much it was so expensive. You could easily pay for a tape drive that cost as much as your computer. You could easily pay for an external hard drive that was several hundred dollars. So a lot of people were just, the cost was prohibitive. If you, you know, that was what they were thinking. But what's the cost of you having to do everything over again from scratch? Or some things you'll never be able to recreate. Now that was back in the days where it was really just about documents. It was way before music was on your computer. It was way before all your pictures were digital. It was just really work that you would be losing. Spreadsheets. Um, Word documents, uh, databases, those were the main things back then that I lost. Today, I couldn't imagine losing everything. It would be devastating because it would be all of those things plus every picture I've taken over the last 15, 20 years, every piece of music I have, every video I have, everything. So I couldn't imagine that kind of devastation now. So I'm very, very, very backup paranoid. Um, your data should be in no less than three places. If it's only in two, you're still at risk. So three places, and one of those places should not be anywhere near the computer, meaning it should be off-site. So place number one, obviously, data is still on your computer. Place number two. Most, for most people, it's their time machine backup, whatever that device is. Place number three should be somewhere not in your house or office. Because if your house or office comes under some kind of catastrophe, flood, fire, burglary, whatever, your insurance company will give you a check and say, here you go. And you're supposed to go out and rebuy everything, but how are you going to buy back your data? You can't. So if your computer gets stolen, fried, burned, water, whatever, and the backup sitting right next to it gets the same thing, what good is that check going to do you other than replacing the hardware? So that's what, I, when I say I'm backup paranoid, I am to the point to where I even think that far, that if I not only lost this immediate computer, yeah, I'd have the backup, that's great, but what if something happened to that backup too? Or... How many, when was the last time you checked your time machine backup to see if it's really doing what it's supposed to do? When was the last time you tried to restore a file? So you could be sitting there thinking it's backed up every day. And who knows? Maybe it's not. So if you're relying on just the two things, you're already at risk. 
And uh, another story, my sister, same thing. She lost data once, and we got her on a backup. And she was backing up every day. This is before time machine. And same thing, hard drive crashed, you know, maybe a year later. And she's like, hey, I have my backup drive. This is great. And it hadn't been backing up for a year. The software wasn't running. So there was something that wasn't installed. Something wasn't turned on. And so she thought it was backing up every day, and it wasn't. And she lost a year's worth of stuff because the last backup was a year old. So I hope I've sufficiently frightened you <laughs> to where now you're starting to think, am I really backed up? Now, let's start with the simple things first. Let's start with most of you are probably backing up to one of these things, an external hard drive. And there are other things in this, in this grid besides hard drives, but mostly hard drives. Um, hard drives are mechanical, for the most part, are mechanical devices, even solid state. They're, they're made by humans, so therefore, they will eventually fail. I don't care what brand you buy. I don't care how expensive it was. I don't care how many bells and whistles it has. Eventually, that device you bought will die. So the point of having a backup is that hopefully both things won't die at the exact same time. The computer dies, you still have the backup. If the backup dies, you still have the computer, you can buy a new backup. So that's the idea. So that's why I say two, you know, is not enough because again, they could both be working, but something other, some other catastrophe could happen to them. So that's why you want something somewhere else. Now let's uh, talk about that strategy of somewhere else. I mentioned this uh, last month when we were talking about the cloud services and I said that um, my, my original strategy for having an off-site backup was to buy two more external hard drives and rotate them between my safe deposit box. So I would copy everything on the one, and we'll talk about how to do that in a minute, and take it over to the safe deposit box, so there's one off-site, and then I'd be copying stuff to the second one, and then once a week, I'd just rotate it. And that worked great for maybe the first two weeks. Because life happens. You go out of town, you forget, you just get lazy, you just don't think about doing it, you, know, you don't want to make the trip to the bank, it's too cold outside, whatever. So once a week turned into every two weeks. Every two weeks turned into every three weeks. Every three weeks turned into once a month. Once a month turned into, I can't remember the last time I did it. And so there was one old backup now sitting in the safe deposit box and one here. And that, again, defeats the purpose because now if something happened to all this and I had to go to the safe deposit box, that date is now over a month old. So that's when I realized that for me personally, the once a week thing wasn't working because I just wasn't diligent about making that trade every week. Um, and that's when I turned to my third backup being cloud-based. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But let's get to uh, first things first. So when you go to buy a hard drive today, there are tons of options. And more than likely, the drive you buy today is going to have um, one or more, well, at least one way, but two or more ways of connecting it to your computer. And the way you connect it to your computer will depend on your computer because it depends on how old your computer is or how new your computer is. This particular one we're looking at now uh, is fairly an older setup where it's got FireWire 800, which had always been a Mac thing for years and years until Apple stopped putting FireWire ports on computers. And then, of course, USB is on every computer, so that's a safe option, but USB 2 is not as fast. And then eSATA, most people are not going to go with that option because it's not built in. You'd have to buy something special to connect to it. Uh, so I would say today's options are most likely going to be USB and FireWire based for you. And I would say, unless you're, unless you're dealing with an older computer that has FireWire, I would stick to USB. Um, 
Since it's a backup that is running most likely in the background, even a USB 2 drive is fast enough because you're not waiting on it. It's connected, it's doing its thing in the background. It's not like you're having to wait for it to finish before you can do something else. However, if your computer does have USB 3, you have a newer computer or you have a card in your desktop computer that can do USB 3, I highly recommend USB 3 drives. They're a lot cheaper than Firewire ever was and they're just as fast if not faster for most things. Uh, so, for example, here's a drive, an external drive I carry with me in my luggage that has FireWire 800 and the cable hanging out of it is USB 3. So this plugs into my USB port on my computer, which this is a newer MacBook Pro, so it has USB 3, so I get to take advantage of the speed. Now, I said I carry this one in my luggage. What's that one for? Because we talked about time machine at home, Offsite is crash plan for me right now. And why do I have that one? What's that? Computer dies during accounting. Yes, close. His question was, why do I carry this? And he said, if my computer dies during the conference. He's almost right. He's that would be this one. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. So I can't remember when. Uh, what what version of the OS it was, but at one point Apple made Time Machine so that it could back up to more than one drive. Like you could you could of course back up to your main drive that you back up to all the time, but you could plug in another drive and say, "Hey, Time Machine, use this one too," and then Time Machine would alternate between them if they're both connected. If they're not both connected, then whenever you plug in the other one, it would use that one to do that backup and then go back to the main one. It figures it out. It knows what to do. So I actually carry with me two external drives. This one is my other time machine backup drive. And that means if I'm on the road, which I'm typically on the road for at least a week at a time, I can plug this in when I'm in the hotel at night and my computer still backs up every day as opposed to going a whole week without it backing up at all, or with it only backing up to crash point. So again, I'm that paranoid, because you start to think, could I lose what I did all last week? I wouldn't like it, maybe, depends on what I did last week. So I want to not have that problem. So when I'm on the road, I plug this one in so it does time machine, when I'm at home, it automatically backs up to a time capsule, wirelessly. So I stay backed up even on the road. Don't computers back up locally if you don't have a time capsule? Yes and no. <laughs> so there is a feature inside Mac OS X, what he's referring to, that backs up in the case of throwing something away locally. But that doesn't do anything for you if that drive dies or if you screw up the data and didn't throw it away. So it's limited on what it does locally compared to actually having the drive. That only works with a laptop, a mobile device, a Which, desktop. Yeah. It doesn't do that at all. Yeah. So, and it's limited, so I don't trust it for everything. Can you boot from the time? Good question, and the answer is no, which is why we have this one. What was the question? Question was, let's say I'm on the road three days later, the hard drive dies or whatever, or I'm right before a presentation and something happens. I have my time machine that backed up last night. Can I boot from it and do my presentation? No. I can put in a new drive, reformat the drive, and restore hours later, but I can't boot from this in an emergency, which is why there's this one. This is, a, this is the second drive I carry with me, and this one is bootable. So now, what's going on behind the scenes is I have a program running right now, because I haven't done it in a while, called Super Duper. It's halfway done, almost. And SuperDuper is right now updating, as we speak, my internal drive onto this one. 
which I hadn't done in a while. Again, life happens, I forgot. So this is my emergency in the moment. Something happened before I speak before you know, a thousand people. And I can't wait for hours for Time Machine to restore. I need to be on stage right now and something happened. Plug this drive in, reboot, boot from that drive, continue working. Plug it into someone else's computer. That too. Well, why don't you use that one? Why don't I use that one for what? As your backup device instead of the... Because this is a process I have to initiate manually and remember to do it. Time machine runs automatically. Remember the I'm not going to go to the bank every week and I'm not going to remember to plug that in every day and hit the button and tell it to do it. But if I just, just plug a drive in and it's just doing it on its own, then I have to think about it. Also, the time machine one is handy for just minor screw ups. Threw away something, corrupted something, saved over something. I just want to get that one file back. Plug this one in and get it back. Go ahead. Super duper can be set to automatically back. Sure. And I do have it doing my server that way. Yep. See, what she just said is that she clarified the super duper can be scheduled. Like, and I do have it doing that on a machine at home where it's scheduled, it, back, it, cl it updates the clone every, day, every night at 2 a.m., whatever. If you have Super Duper and you have multiple users on your computer, does it back up? It's backing up the whole drive. So if this drive was completely dead, wiped out, I could restore from this one and be right back to where it was. And co Carbon Copy Cloner would be... Carbon Copy Cloner is the equivalent. It does the same thing. Um, so Ford Chevy, they're both the same, both have the same feature set for the most part. Yes. Ooh, time machine goes back how far? Geniuses? Several years. Snow Leopard? It wasn't before Snow Leopard? Leopard? Leopard's in me. So at least Snow Leopard, maybe Leopard. I'm thinking it was before Snow Leopard. Because Snow Leopard was, what, 10.6? Yeah. We had Time Machine before then. So at least Leopard. So Time Machine goes way, get back quite a far. Power PC? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of jumped ahead. I wasn't ready to do Super Duper yet, but let's, um, let's go back. So let's talk about the different ways of using, again, we're starting with Time Machine, the different ways of using it. So I already talked about one, buying an external drive, plugging it in. Time Machine's already geared to it. So when you plug in an external drive for the first time, it says, hey, do you want to use me for Time Machine? And if you do, you say yes, and it just sets itself up and does it. And while that drive is being while that drive is being or while that drive is plugged in, Time Machine will do a backup while your computer's um, on. I should say because now you can even do it while it's sleeping. Uh, it will do a backup every hour, and it will back up anything that's changed within the last hour. Now, of course, if it's backing up every hour, at some point, no matter how large that drive is that you plugged in it's going to fill up. It might take weeks, months, years, but it's eventually, eventually from backing up every hour and then archiving, and then it starts archiving by week and by month, but it's going to keep backing up until that drive is full. So what happens at that point? Well, let's go into system preferences. Sorry, isn't the property backups after the initial backup is like the entire drive? Yes, and eventually you'll do enough changes to where the drive fills up. Okay, so here's Time Machine. And so it does hourly backups for the um, 24 hours, daily backups for the past months, and weekly backups for previous months. Uh, the oldest backups are deleted when the drive becomes full. When I look at Time Machine to back it up, and select backup. Mm -hmm. It tells me it was uh, backed up at 
when he too lot her and he was over to uh, the night before. Sure. And yet I had been using it. So I just keep backing it up now. Why is not doing it every hour? It should be. Anyway, no wires wouldn't be working hourly. It's selected to turn them off. You sure this is turned on? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I've seen that if for some reason it suddenly decides, oh, I need to do a deep scan, and the deep scan takes three hours, you're not going to get an hourly backup. It decides suddenly that, oh, I don't have a good valid index of what you've got in terms of the changes, so I'm going to read down your entire time machine drive and refresh my scans so that I know exactly what you've got. So when it does that, if you've got a really large backup, it can take hours to do that. I've seen it where it takes three or four hours. So obviously you don't get hourly backups because it's still doing the one that started three hours ago. That can happen. And the last one is corrupted. So, and that's, that's another one that uh, Phyllis just said, if the last one was corrupted for whatever reason, it'll hang indefinitely until you get rid of the corrupted backup. Yeah, and, and we haven't gotten to it and probably won't, but when you back up, you back up your power too, and sometimes when you have an external drive and there's a micro outage on your power, that's what corrupts the drive, and that's the reason why we always recommend you put external drives and test out machines on a UPS. Because otherwise, those things will happen, and you won't even know that it happened until it's too late. Who's not using, who's using a desktop computer that doesn't have a UPS? Does not have a UPS. Okay. That's another, thanks for reminding me of one thing I would have forgotten, but, um... <sighs> so, uh, there's a company that I recommend called APC. APC makes um, UPS, in my opinion, the best UPS backups for personal computers. Um, never had a, never had an issue with theirs. And what a UPS is, for those that don't know, is the small ones look like just a giant power brick. The bigger ones look like a little mini tower. And what they're, what's in it, what makes it so big, is that there's a battery in it. And you plug in your computer, your hard drives, your whatever else you want to keep power. If the power goes out or be protected in the case of a big surge or whatever. And it will give you so many minutes of power while the power is out. Now, if, you're, if, if we're in a storm and your power is out for three hours, more than likely this is not going to last for three hours. It could be 15 minutes, it could be 20 minutes, it could be 40 minutes, it could be an hour, depending on the size of the backup and the load that's on it. The idea here is that you're working on a computer, all the lights go off, your computer stays on long enough for you to save and properly shut it down. What if you're not home? What if you're not at your computer when it happens? These now will plug in via USB cable into your computer and run so the software that you download for it will detect that it, your computer is now on battery power and shut it down for you. So even if you're not sitting at your computer, this will more than likely handle the shutdown and do a better shutdown than just power going off. So I highly recommend UPSs not only for desktop computers, but those external hard drives and things you're backing up with even if you're on a laptop. Because your laptop will stay on if the power goes off because it's already got a battery in it, but the hard drive won't. And hard drives that are being used when the power goes out, that's usually what corrupts them because they're not being shut down or shut off properly. They're just being turned off. So what happens if the power outage goes, the computer is shutting down, at what point do you know what's been saved and what hasn't? You probably won't know what's been saved and what, ha what hasn't if it's in the middle of a backup when this shuts down. When it shuts down, it's just like if you, for example, time machine, like I said, is going every hour. Let's say you decide, hey, I'm, I'm done for the night. Uh, Apple menu shut down, and it's in the middle of a time machine backup. It's going to stop the backup and shut the computer down. So you would not have gotten that last hour because it was in the middle of it, so it didn't finish. So it would be no different than, than you doing it. 
in the middle of a backup. In other words, you've got to restart and do it all over. Well, that happens pretty much daily for people because, again, if you shut down in the middle of a time machine backup, as long as it wasn't the initial backup, it, you just didn't back up that last hour. So the next time your computer comes on, it'll start the backup again. So it's not, it's not something you really have to manage. Well, this will do, um, it doesn't do line conditioning, but it handles those brownout situations too, because what this is monitoring is consistent for consistent power. The power drops below something that's consistent, this kicks off. Right. So I highly recommend an APC backup, no matter what size you get, need, whatever. And like I said, they come in all different flavors and sizes. So I traditionally got the bigger ones um, because I was plugging a lot of things into them, like towers and things like that. But all of my equipment, and by the way, I don't just use these for computer equipment. I use them for stereo equipment, TV equipment, anything I want protected. That I don't want to suffer damage because of a power outage. Two things. My husband has a very expensive electronic keyboard, and he's got one just dedicated to that. Yep. And he's got it. Um, I have an older model of the ABC. The newer ones still have an audible alert. Say you're in another room and it happens. You can get yeah. Um, and by the way, and now and you can disable it. <laughs> I, I, I like that. Unless there are ten of them going off in the middle of the night. <laughs> Been there. Three a.m. Yeah, at three a.m. So I'm happy that the audible alert can be turned off. Go ahead, and then over you. Power can be weird. Go ahead. All right. Well, you were saying using the UPS, but what I'm hearing in the last half of the explanation was just simply having a surge suppressor. No. No. Okay. I never said just a surge suppressor. No, no, I know you did. Yeah. I said it, and this, by the way, these have surge suppressors built in. Okay, here, and then over here. Well, first reaction, it's the micro it's a little short burst that really confuses you. But the other thing is, is if you have your, your desktop machine sitting there and you work there and all your drives are all plugged in, and you've also got a couple of small task lights that are low wattage, <laughs> you plug those in because when the power goes out and every other light in the house is out, you can see to safely extricate yourself physically from the situation and find your flashlight. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, how, how reliable is the whole house surge protector that we have in our, you know, in the main It's a surge protector, and I can't tell you how reliable it is, but let's say it protected you from a surge. It's not going to protect you from a power outage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So, yeah, it may be one time. Oh. Right. Not only that, but even the outlets that you do, some of them like. You now, I still see green dot. They have special stuff for that. You see one with a little triangle on it. That's the one where it's, there, there's nothing else on that. You have direct ground all the way back to your panel. All the other stuff that you use on your, on, on your electrical in there. Now, the other reason I've recommended APC in the past, I don't know if they still do it, but they were so confident in their in their units that they would guarantee if anything died that was plugged into it, they'd replace it. No matter what it was. So you got a five thousand dollar computer that was plugged into it that died because it was plugged in, they'd replace it. I've got an old one. I don't even remember how many years old it is. How do I know? Unplug it. Okay. See, when I have a computer that plugs in, I plug it in. Unplug it from the wall and see if it keeps everything on. More than likely, it's not the age of the unit, it's the age of the battery in it. Because these have batteries in them that need to be replaced ever so often. 
All right, so I would probably say if it's years old and you've never replaced the battery, the battery probably doesn't work. So you can replace the battery? Oh, sure, you can replace the battery. They're not cheap. In most cases, you, there's a button where you can test. Yeah, I don't trust the button. <laughs> so, is this a much is this more economical to buy a new unit, a battery for the unit in case the battery doesn't go bad? Depends on the unit how old it is. Some right. Are trying to get the batteries. It depends on the unit, how old it is. Uh, I tend to not replace the batteries. I tend to replace the units just because the units come up with more features and can do more things and so forth and so on. Uh, but I have replaced the batteries too, especially on the more expensive ones like these towers because I'm not buying this over again. I'd rather just replace the battery. Okay. What, is it lithium or nitrogen? No. Or they like batteries. Yeah. They're like this big. <laughs> APC you used to sit there and give you a, a second package. You can either buy just the battery or you can buy the battery with a warranty so that it would re it would renew your warranty on the original unit. Okay. I don't know if they're still doing I don't either. Terry, a couple of things. A lot of people trust their power line, their outlets and all of that, and stuff that I've looked into is just like disaster. What does that mean? Wire nuts not fastened properly. Oh, things in the line. yeah. People's people's wires in their homes could be a mess. I, I would never say that you're safe just with some kind of whole whole house anything, because that's only as good as the outlet that ha that particular device is plugged into. And how it's wired with those right. Problems. So the, this is really providing the hardware and the software um, prevention. Correct. Issue. So it's like it's not just like the back of it. It could be like the small hard drive. You know, surgery, fried, whole drive, Absolutely. So you, you I remember, um, again, years years ago before I got into UPS systems, uh, I came home one day and there had been a power outage. I don't know what, I didn't, didn't, I wasn't home, so I don't know what happened. But everything in a particular room was fried. You might mention that it also... Protected. Everything else in the whole house was fine, except that one bedroom. Everything that was plugged in in that bedroom was dead. Your communications cables, either coax or phone lines, also plug into that and it protects those from light yeah. strikes. So, we beat that topic to death. If you're not on a UPS, and again, don't think, I don't need a UPS because I'm on a laptop, unless you never plug anything else into that laptop. Because if you're plugging in anything that goes into the wall besides the laptop should probably be on a UPS. Because the laptop's on a battery, but everything else isn't. Okay, um, so external drives, all different capacities. USB is probably the way to go today because they're cheaper and 2.0 is fast enough for backup. And if you got 3.0, it's even better. And the other option, of course, is Apple's um, or is it time capsule. Now, the time capsule itself is expensive for what you're really getting if you add it up. But for the person that says, I want a no-brainer solution that I just plug in and it works, then Time Capsule's great. Uh, I consider myself a professional user, <laughs> but even I have a Time Capsule because at, at the time that I got it was for my studio, and I didn't have a server at the time, I didn't have any other way of backing up the stuff in the studio, and the Time Capsule was the easiest option at the time. So, what's a time capsule? A time capsule is two things. It's an airport base station, so it could be your wireless network, and it's got a hard drive built in that does wireless time machine backups. Even if your computer is not a laptop, even if it's a desktop computer, it will still back up. Now, it's got, uh, let's see if I've got a picture of uh, maybe the tech specs. Yeah, I was gonna say, it's got ethernet ports in it as well. So you can plug in your wired computers. Uh, it's got a USB port to plug in printers. And I think you can extend the storage by plugging in an external hard drive if you need more room. And of course, power. So basically this would be your wireless network and 
second backup, or, or backup, I should say, your, your second place for data. Um, it's pretty much it. You plug it in, you, you use the airport utility to set it up, you tell Time Machine to start backing up to it, and you don't have to think about it. If you already have a wireless network, but you still want to use a time capsule, you can. Just don't use the wireless network in the time capsule. Or use it as a second network or a second um, uh, wireless zone if you want. Then don't get a time capsule. What are they costing what are time capsules these days? Are, well, the uh, airport base station is like 189, so a time capsule, you know, 299. 299. Yeah, they can be two or three terabytes. <sighs> it's uses, it will be backwards compatible to anything that can run time machine. It will back up multiple computers. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's another advantage, by the way, is that a time capsule, unlike an external hard drive, external hard drive is usually plugged into one computer, and certainly one at a time, whereas a time capsule can back up multiple computers. So, for example, your whole family could be using one time capsule to back up to, and at that point, you probably want the three terabyte option. Yeah. What happens with an airport that's plugged into an external hard Pardon? With the airport screen, plug in an external hard drive? Um, I don't know what the current status of that is because, and I know, meaning, I know you can plug in an external hard drive, but Apple kept going back and forth whether or not that hard drive could be used for time machine or not. At one point it could, then they stopped it, then they turned it back on, then they stopped it. I don't know. Not entirely reliable. Yeah, I don't know where they are with that now because obviously they want, if you're going to do that, they want you to buy a time capsule. So they kept disabling that feature. Save some money if you have multiple computers and you don't want to buy a time capsule because somebody said they already have a wireless network. If you buy the server package for Mavericks, which is what, $25? You can make any machine that's running that package a time machine server, which means you can plug in a disk to it and other machines on the network can use that as a time capsule. Right. Now, that's with some caveats. That's, like you said, A, you're going to uh, install Maverick's server on it, which now is just an application. It's no big deal. Two, you're going to plug in a big enough drive in it to back up your other computers. Three, you're going to keep that computer on yes. at all times to back up your other computers. On a UPS. On a UPS. So if you're okay with doing all of those things, then I highly recommend doing it that way, and it will save you money over this. If you're using a uh, time capsule with Wi-Fi, do your computers have to be set up so that they are using that particular Wi-Fi connection? Or will it take the computers that are connected to uh, other Wi-Fi's? Okay, so his question was, if let's say I plug in a time, or set up a time capsule and I have five computers. And his question was, do all five computers have to be on that wireless network to be backed up. They don't have to be on that wireless network, they have to be on that network. Meaning that if they're not either wire, wired to it or wirelessly connected to it, then they can't see it to back up to it. So it's gotta be one or the other. They can be on a different wireless network as long as they're plugged in physically, or they have to be on the same wireless network. So time capsule, and by the way, again, you can just, if you have a, your network's all set up the way you want, you can just buy a time capsule and turn off the Wi-Fi option and just use it as a networked backup drive plugged in physically. So like, for example, let's say you've got a Comcast router or, or a Verizon router, and you're happy with all the way that all works. You're happy with the Wi-Fi, you're happy... It could happen. You're happy with the way that all works. <laughs> you could just get the time capsule and plug in the Ethernet cable to that existing router, and it would show up to all your computers as a network time capsule, even if you're not using the Wi-Fi on it. 
Now, I have, it's been a long time since I've used a time capsule. I mean, when time capsule first came out, I used one as my wireless network. And way, way back then, when the very first time capsule, the thing I didn't like about it, and the reason I ended up eventually not using it for that, was that every time my machine would go to do a backup, the Wi-Fi would slow down, period, to a crawl. I don't know if any time capsule users are still experiencing that, but that was way back in the early days. I don't know if that's still the case. No one's chiming in, so I'm assuming that they resolved that. Wi-Fi is just kind of faster, so you might not Yeah, that could be the case as well. And there's faster CPUs in the, in the box now. Yep. Yeah, they have dual band. And they have dual band, and now the new one's got AC and all good stuff. So, gig Ethernet, all good things. So, that's time. So, you have two ways, or actually three ways to do time machine. A, just plug in an external drive, any drive you want. As, oh, by the way, <laughs> before I say any drive you want. What size drive should I buy for time machine? Bigger than the drive in your computer. It's obviously, okay, let's start with that. It's got to be at least, as a minimum, the same size as the drive you're backing up or bigger. So if you have a one terabyte drive inside your computer, your time machine backup has to at least, at least be a one terabyte external drive or bigger. Okay, so that's the minimum, but how big should I go? Let's say I've got a one terabyte drive. How big should I get my time machine backup drive? As big as you can afford. Why? How many years do you want? I thought you never know. Forget one of the set of drives that are here. Okay. Why go big? I just, uh, you, Jim's got it, but I just want to hear anyone else. Why go big? Why go three terabyte, four terabyte? Why go bigger? That's the answer. The bigger the drive that you're plugging in, the further back in time you'll be able to go. Because remember, when it fills up, what does it start to do? Delete the old ones. So if I want to be able to go back six months in time, then I need a drive that can be big enough to hold six months worth of backups. If I want to go be able to go back a year back, then I need a really big drive to be able to go back that far. The smaller the drive, the less I'll be able to go back. Is there a way to take the older stuff and put it on Nope. Because then that's not backed up. The minute you say, can I move it on to something else, what's backing that up? Yeah. Or something else. Right. <laughs> Can you talk for a minute about the third-party drives about any brands you recommend? Okay, this question was, it's a dicey topic for me. So this question was, are there any brands I recommend or don't recommend? I will say this. I haven't bought a brand that hasn't crashed. We'll see. OWC. Western Digital, you name it. I've had all of them crash at some point, Seagate, all of them. So now the question becomes, have I run into one that's more reliable than the next? I probably had the least amount of problems out of OWC, but you gotta keep in mind, OWC is, they don't make drives, they're putting drives in their cases. So they're putting Western Digital, they're putting Seagate, they're putting these drives in there. So now we're talking brands of drives. And I honestly haven't found one to be significantly more reliable than the next one. And anyone else can chime in if they just have a brand they hate. We made a couple of manufacturers. Yeah. Everything else is made by them. Are we seeing any solid state stuff at all? No moving parts? No, no. Yes, uh, there are all kinds of solid state options. As a matter of fact, if you go to MacSales.com, which is OWC, and you go to uh, external drives, uh, do I want external drives? Actually, let me go to solid state. Easier. 
<coughs> they make solid state drives, both internal and external. Okay. Here's the problem. They're not cheap yet. They're not cheap. And they're not big, meaning they're not cheap. So for 449, you're only going to get a 480 gig drop. They do break, by the way. If it's man made, it will die. <laughs> so there's no such thing as something else. I guess I'll say it'll never crash. Everything will crash at some point. It might be more reliable, but it will eventually die. So solid state's great, speed, fast, quiet, no noise, no moving parts, more reliable, but much more expensive. Price per gigabyte. So as far as brands, I buy OWC, Western Digital, Seagate, let's see. Those are the ones I normally buy. And again, I haven't found one. Oh my God, this one lasted three years and this one only lasted two. I'm not running to that. Yep. And as uh, Jack said, it's only a couple manufacturers manufacturing all of them now anyway. What about Drobo? Hmm? What about Drobo? Oh, yeah. oh Drobo. Okay. <laughs> I personally have not had major hardware issues. Others have. So what's a Drobo? Drobo is a, it's a device that looks like this, and inside of it, let's see if I've got a picture here. Of course not. Nope, I don't want to do the giveaway. Uh, how about how it works? Overview. I don't want to watch a video. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So a Drobo is a, is a case that can contain two or more hard drives. And the idea behind Drobo, which again is why I bought it in the first place, is that if one drive dies, you're still protected. So one drive in there can completely fail, die immediately, and you haven't lost anything. Because it's re redundancy, it's putting the data on more than one drive. Now, you can even turn, if you, if you want to if you're super paranoid, you can even turn on now in the newer ones, two drives can die. It's going to eat up more space, obviously, but it will protect you against two drive failures at the same time. Now, what's the, again, that's the idea behind Drobo. Does it mean you don't have to back up? No. It's just saying that I'm protecting you in case of a hardware failure. Your drive died, it, one of those, let's say drive number three died, drive number three's light will go red, you won't skip a beat, you go buy a new drive, pop out number three, pop in a new one, and keep working. That's the point of Drobo. Where people have run into issues is not with that, but with the box itself. The box itself dying or the box itself having issues. I personally, again, I've got one, two, three, four, five Drobos to date. Not a single failure. All of them are on UPSs, of course. So the single point of failure, which is usually the power supply, is somewhat protected. Okay. So, and I've used Drobo now for. Five years? Easy? With not a single issue. No, not a single hardware issue. This is where I meant this is what I meant about they still need to be backed up. My first Drobo problem I ever had was not with the Drobo itself, but I had I was using it for my file server, so I had, you know, terabytes worth of stuff on there. And the directory of the drive got screwed up. Meaning that Mac OS didn't know what was on the drive anymore. Hardware's fine, green lights across the board, hardware's running great, but Mac OS couldn't figure out what was on the drive anymore, to the point to where I had to reformat it and restore from the backup, which was a super duper backup scheduled to run every night at 2 a.m. 
So I lost whatever had happened that morning between 2 a.m. and that directory issue. Just restore it from the previous backup. Everything was there. So, again, anything can go wrong with anything backup being multiple places. And to this day, um, I have one Drobo that is my main server that stores everything. And another Drobo backing it up and crash plan backing that up. <laughs> so I don't rely on anything, any one thing. All this stuff is predicated upon the electrical system that this stuff is feeding from to be good. And now these like neutral goes out. Your electric your electric could be perfectly fine and the drive could still die. I know, I know, but this is things that I've seen happen. Yeah. Somebody had that. Uh, you pull it out at the panel, there's no ground. 220 volts within the house of Okay. So, Drobo, that's what Drobo is all about. If you've ever wondered what's, what's a Drobo, that's what it is. It's, to, it's designed to protect you against a physical hardware, hard drive crash by being redundant onto multiple drives. Now, Drobo is not the only company doing that. There's Synology, they do their own, there are other companies that do this. What attracted me to Drobo in the first place, and the reason I still use them, is theirs was the first one where all five or four or eight, how many ever, whatever size unit you buy, the drives didn't have to be the same size. Now, that's not a big, as big of a concern today because drives are so cheap, but back when drives were still relatively expensive, I could stick in a terabyte I had left over from something else. I could stick in a 500 megabyte, I could stick in a gigabyte, I could stick in whatever. And it would just figure it all out. It's still important today because when you want to upsize, you can do one True. at a time. Right. And never miss a beat. True. So, for example, let's say that was five one terabyte drives and one of those died. What am I going to replace it with? Something larger. Something larger, a two or a three, because they're cheaper now. So I could stick that two in there. Is what, and that's what Jim said. Without having to make all five of them twos. Can we talk about that up to the cloud? Sure. So, backing up to the cloud. Uh, crash plan. That's the one I recommend. Now, um, I researched two companies when I decided to do this. When I decided my back and forth to the safe deposit box wasn't going to work. And the first one was, and I always forget the name, Carbonite. Carbonite, thank you. Carbonite was the popular one. That was the one I always heard about, read in the magazine, saw, so forth and so on. So I was, oh, let me go sign up for a trial of Carbonite and try it out. Sign up for the trial, set it up to do my first backup. Says you can't. Because, and again, I don't know if it's still the case, but back then, Carbonite was unlimited from an internal drive, if you were a Mac user. If you were a Mac user and wanted to back up an external drive, couldn't do it, period. It would give you a warning, cannot choose an external drive for backup. And my brain immediately says, if it's unlimited and I'm paying you whatever your cost is, where do you, why do you care which drive I store it on? So that was the, the shortest trial I've ever done. <laughs> it was an immediately stop dead in my tracks, delete uh, Carbonite, go look for something else. I found Crash Plan. Crash Plan being very Mac friendly, unlimited uh, data, didn't care if it was external, didn't care if it was a server, didn't care what it was. You're paying for the unlimited storage, whatever the monthly fee was, and that was it. Um, so let's see. Let's see if I have a better way to see it here. Okay, some other options they do. So first of all, what is Crash Plan? Crash Plan is an online service that says once you sign up and pay whichever plan you want for as much data as you want to back up, you download and install their software. Their software runs in the background just like Time Machine does, and it backs up whatever you select, whatever drives, folders, whatever you want, to the cloud, so over the internet. 400 and whatever bit encryption, so it's pretty as secure as anything else. Um, 
It will take a long time to do your first backup. Months, depending on how much data you have. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, yes. you'll be, be there a while. Okay, mine probably took, and again, I, but I wasn't running it 24 hours a day. I was only running it at night because I didn't want to tie up my bandwidth during the day. So I was running it 12 hours a night, and it took, I think, three months, four months to back up everything. Yes, they do. So the other option is, which I still to this day don't understand why you do it, but if you don't want to wait, unless you're, unless you're capped at bandwidth or something like that, but if your bandwidth isn't capped and you can dial down the speed and all that and it's not going to cost you anymore, I don't understand why you do this. But what you can do is you can say, hey, crash plan, I don't want to take three months to back up. I want to pay extra. You send me a hard drive. I'll use your software back up to that hard drive and send it back to you. When I send it back to you, you plug it in to my account, and then from that point on, my system knows that I'm backed up and only backs up the new stuff or changes or whatever. Now, that option, of course, costs money. As a matter of fact, I, last time I checked, I think it was more than the cost of a hard drive. So they're basically selling you a drive even though they're getting it back. Uh, <laughs> but they're selling you a drive, getting it back, and let's say it was $200, $300, whatever, and your stuff's backed up on, online immediately. The reason I never understood that is, well, while I'm waiting, I can still be doing my own backups offsite. So why would I pay them an extra two or three hundred dollars to have it there immediately? I never understood the point of that. Make money. It's a startup workflow. Okay. Well, they offered as an option. Now, the other, the flip side of that option, I totally get. Let's say fire crime, flood, whatever, and everything's gone, now you need all that stuff back, I don't want to wait a month to download it. <laughs> so they will send you a hard drive with your stuff on it to restore from. That I pay for. <laughs> that, no, no question. But the initial backup, I don't care how long it takes. Let it, it's doing background. What do I care? I'm already backed up all the other places. This is one more backup. So, crash plan is the one I use. Now, they are, let's say you don't trust the cloud. You don't trust your stuff on their servers because everybody's been hacked. Target, recently, say no more. So everyone's been hacked. They offer the option where it says free that you and a relative and a buddy can set up the software to back up to each other's house. So I could take a drive over to my sister's house, plug it into her computer, and use CrashPlan to back up my stuff to that drop. Automatically. So that beats the safe, safety deposit box option. Because it's automatic. I don't have to make a trip. Once I set it all up, it just does it online between the two locations. <coughs> that doesn't cost anything. Because your, your, it's your storage, it's your computer, it's your bandwidth. They're not charging you anything for that. So, you have that option as well. Um, any other crash plan questions? How many terabytes? Initially, I know it was over one. Now it's probably between all my computers, closer to four. So, I have roughly three point something terabytes backed up to crash plan. Between multiple computers. Can you back up everything on your disk? Because I see some of these plans where all they want to back up is your home directory. You choose whatever you want. You want to choose the whole drive, choose the whole drive. I choose I don't choose the whole drive because to me that's a waste. Why am I gonna back up my applications to crash plan? My system to crash plan. I already have all my other backups for that. I back up my data to crash plan. The things I can't replace. Yeah, then that makes sense. So their default setting, as, as Sheeta pointed out, is to back up your user folder. Because that's all the stuff that you can't replace. Does Crash Plan work with both Macs and PCs? It does. And is the software free? Software is free, yeah. 
Question was, does it work on both Mac, PC, cross-platform, and is the software free? Yes, yes. How, how do you use it to restore something? How do you get something off the Okay. Yeah. Okay. Couple of ways. Uh, one, his question was, how do I restore something? Let's say I, here's a good scenario. I deleted a folder three months ago. And my time machine backup's too small to go get it back because it's already been deleted. So it's not on time machine anymore. It's not on my internal hard drive anymore. But more than likely, it's still on crash plan. So I launch the crash plan application, click restore. It get, you know, take, you have to weed down through your directories or your folders, go find the thing you want, click restore. And it will download it from crash plan back to your hard drive or back to in, another hard drive. Cause you can, it's, again, you can log on to it even from the web. So you can go to the website, log in and do it from a different computer that you want that one file on. And they also have uh, iPhone and iPad apps which are free. So you can sign in with your iPad app and grab the Word document you need while you're on the go or whatever it is you need on the go. So your, your data is accessible in multiple ways. And if it's a total disaster, total restore, like I said, you probably want to just have them send you a drive. Or multiple drives, depending on how many terabytes you have. Why would you still need local time machine back? Good question. Why would I still do Time Machine then if I could use a crash plan? Because Time Machine is faster. If it's not a total disaster, I'd much rather do a restore from Time Machine that's happening in an hour or two versus, or if it's a file in, in a minute, versus the having to go find it on crash plan and wait for it to download over the internet. So it's speed. And again, am I ever going to trust one thing? No. So why would I just trust crash plan? Any more than I would just trust time machine. Just because it might have the same or something. No power issue, no location. Internet's down. I need a file. Time machine, and then time machine becomes my better option. Um, Justin, you need to maintain History? Yes, it maintains history. So, history versions, so forth and so on. The software, once you install it and launch it and tell it what to back up, is automatically backing up just like Time Machine in the background from that point on. So here it is. This is what's going on on this particular computer. So on this computer, I'm backing up 300 and roughly 390 gigs. And as you can see, it's mostly home folders and everything that's on my second um, partition. If I need to restore something, restore, and then go grab the item that I need to restore, which I'm not logged into my regular account, so this is why it's not listing everything yet. How much free storage do you give you? Unlimited. It's, oh, free storage? Well, they don't give you any free storage. If you're using the free option, that means you're backing up to another off-site location that you set up. They don't, nothing, if you're using them to do your backup, then it's not free. So we can look at plans. So the one I initially went with was the family plan back in the day. I did a four-year subscription, and it was like five bucks a month back then. So it was like 60 times four, 200, what is that, 240 bucks for four years worth of unlimited backup of 10 computers. Yes. To me, that was a bargain. Price of a hard drive, I'm backed up for four years, all my data, all my computers. Offsite. Then that four years still hasn't come up for renewal yet, so it's still going. 
Got it? Any other crash plan questions? Crash plan access to the data? Can, you'd have to read their terms of service. I believe the answer is no, but I don't remember. I don't keep up with their latest terms of service. You have to pay the uh, full amount for years. Up front, yes. If you're going to do those savings of multiple years, you pay it all at once. Otherwise, you just do the month to month. Any other crash plan questions before I move on? Is there any chance of NSA hacking into them and getting everything? NSA already has everything. <laughs> They've already done it. I'm just using them for my eyes like this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, just call in this there anytime you need a file back. They have it. <laughs> I thought they'd be a great business plan to actually have the NSA pay for themselves, but that is being backed up. Yeah, there you go. Okay, this backup is, or this clone is finally done, so I can now talk about Super Duper and we'll do a demo of Time Machine Restore. Uh, okay, so first and foremost, what's here? Let me get out of everything else. What's SuperDuper? So SuperDuper is an application. I, it's um, free to download and free to use if you don't want to use all the options. If you want to use all the options like scheduling and having to do smart backups and things like that, then I don't know what the cost is. What's SuperDuper these days? $30. I think I bought it back in the day when it was 15 so $15, $30, whatever it is, it's one time pay, you're done, you own the application. What does it do? So I'll walk you through the interface. I've got it set up to copy my hard drive onto an external hard disk called hard disk backup, which has been partitioned into three uh, separate drives. And I tell it to back up all files, so basically make an exact duplicate of this internal hard drive onto this external hard drive. Everything, users, folders, applications, system, everything. But since I paid for it, I get to unlock and use the options. And my options are, whenever I run it, do a smart update. So a smart update says, if it's a terabyte, I'm not gonna waste time doing a whole terabyte onto the external. I'm gonna look at the external and see what changed. And I'm just going to clone it and make it look exactly like your internal, only having to copy over the, new, the different things. So this ends up being an exact copy in a lot less time. Yeah. Um, after, if you're using the schedule options or you want it to do it at night or you set it when you're leaving, you can say, once it's done, uh, shut it down, put the computer to sleep, quit super duper, restart, uh, restart from that drive, whatever you want. And so that's the other drive I carry with me, ends up being that exact clone of this drive. So in any emergency, I can plug this in and boot from it and be right back to where I was before the emergency. So every so often, do you restart from that just to know Absolutely. that it does? Absolutely, yes. Every, every backup should be tested. So at that point, what he's saying is, I'm not gonna do it now because I'm recording the meeting, but I would go to system preferences, and I would say uh, startup disk, and I would then choose that drive and boot from it just to make sure it works. And you can boot using USB. Absolutely. Yep. Doesn't have to be FireWire anymore. Question was, can you boot from USB? And the answer is yes. I have a question. Are all those cables the same? Does it matter? Do you need newer cables for the USB? USB 3 is a different cable, so yes. And the USB 3 drives come with USB 3 cables. Yes, one and two are the same. Well, it has to be a Mac. Yes, correct. It has to be right. The drive has to be set up to be a bootable Mac drive. So when you first buy it, reformat it using disk utility and you're all set. Um, okay, so that's super duper and that's how the interface looks and that's how it works. And again, if you pay for it, you can run the schedule option where you can tell it to do it every so often. Just a caution, a few years ago when we updated the new OS, mm -hmm. and basically lost the whole thing because the duper hadn't updated for it. I wasn't even thinking about it without thinking at that point. So if you go to a new OS, just a little call, make sure that it's Okay. Make sure you're on the latest version of SuperDuper. 
Basically, make sure it's compatible with your newer OS that you just upgraded to. Now, speaking of OS upgrades, one of my favorite things to do with SuperDuper when there's a new OS and I'm not sure if it'll work with everything. So Apple comes, what are we on now, 10.9? Yeah. So next year, Apple comes out with 11, whatever it's called. And I don't know if 11 is going to work with everything. So I'll take one of my hundreds of or dozens of drives that I got laying around and I'll do a super duper clone to that extra drive I've got laying around boot from it and upgrade it and test everything I can do anything I want on that drive throw it away when I'm done who cares because now I just use it as a test it's got my stuff on it it's got my, my current applications on it Boot from it, test everything I want to test, make sure it all works. And if it doesn't, reboot back to the internal and I haven't done anything. Because I never touched the internal. Do sandboxing, yes, I know. I'm giving him the easy one first. Well, it, and not just the OS, but also applications. If you're going to change from um, CS5 to Creative Cloud or something like that. If you have a copy of your old system, you can always switch back. If you're going to do, uh, if you're going to upgrade, even super duper, you test it on the copy of the system that you've upgraded, that, that you call an upgrade, and then you see if it works from there. If you get another drive, so you always use a clone. Before, whether you whether you actually are working with a clone or just using the backup, you always make a clone copy before you make any significant software change anyway. Because you can always then revert. Okay, so now I'm plugging in the time machine backup I carry with me that I updated this morning, I think, or last night. And there it is. So it's a one terabyte portable drive that I carry with me that's used for time machine. And I don't know how this is gonna work since I'm not on that user, but let's see if it works. Okay, time machine. Okay, it works. Okay, so let me cancel out of it. So, um, let's do something here. Let's go to my documents folder. Let's grab this PDF. Let's drag it to the trash. And let's empty trash. It's gone. Oh, I want that. <laughs> How many of us have had that moment? Wait, what did I throw away? Oops. Oops. Wait, where did that, what, what folder was that that I really put in there? I forgot. Oops, come on. So the whole point of Time Machine is that I could, again, testing this live, I don't know if this worked, hopefully. Uh, go to Time Machine, which is an application, launch it, and what Time Machine is now showing me is how far back in time I can go to see the stuff that was in that folder. So there's the PDF. Here's the other thing that I deleted earlier as a test. I can now say restore, and it puts those two things right back where they were. Time machine is a beautiful thing <laughs> for that oops moment. It's, it's just that simple. Now, if your whole drive crashed, it's not a matter of just getting back a single or a few folders or files, then at that point, when you reboot the computer and reformat and reinstall the OS, at the point where you're setting it all up again, it's going to say, do you want to restore from a time machine backup? That's when you plug the drive in and let it pull back over everything. And of course, it's been backing up for months or weeks or years or whatever. It's going to pull back just the latest. So the last backup, basically. That's how Time Machine works. Whether it's an external drive, whether it's a network time capsule, whether it's a server, however time, whatever Time Machine's been backing up to, that's the way it restores. Um, I'm, I'm fishing for more ways that you can use Time Machine. So if you get that sample newsletter open and you did some edits mm -hmm. and saved them, 
Mm-hmm. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. We're going to do it. There you go. It's been a year. All right. It's been a busy year. How about... How come I can't change that? How come I can't change the news? Yes, upgrade. Thank you. Oops. All right, save it. Oops, I didn't mean to save Hello World. Now what? Now, your question was, can I bring Time Machine up while it's open? Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. Let's go, oops, I didn't want that one. Don't save, delete. Uh, let's move this out of the way. This is where I launched it from. Launch Time Machine, which I should probably put that on the dock and keep it there. And go back to a previous version, grab it, and restore. Now the difference is, it's going to say, wait, that document's already there. Because remember, before it was gone, I trashed it. Now it's there. So what's my choice going to be? It says, keep the original, meaning you didn't mean to do what you just did in Time Machine. Keep both, because you're not sure. Or replace the one you just screwed up on with the one from Time Machine. So I would choose, probably, since I'm not sure, keep both. If you kept both, you both. I did. Uh, are there... Names associated with yes. Dates and names. So there's the date from the one I did February 26th. Here's the one I did from today. This one says original. This one doesn't. Yep. Any other time machine questions? I had a time machine that was Okay. If you have to restore your hard drive, where do you get the OS from? Every computer, every Mac comes with an OS disk or key or something now, so that's your worst case scenario. They used to. They used to. Okay. Every one. No, they still come with something, don't they? No, they come with a wire from Apple's servers. Say that again? Okay, that's what I mean. So there's something you can still boot from. Whether it's the, uh, oh, that's right. They, don't they have a, like a hidden partition in them now? Yeah. yeah. So the firm part will download the new recovery partition. Okay. So one way or the other, as long as you have an internet connection, if you, don't have, if you didn't make a copy of the OS yourself, you can still restore I haven't had to do that, obviously, lately, so I don't know what options are there now. The, the other thing about... Because you know why I don't have to do that? Because if my drive crashes, I'm going to plug in one of these and do it, and boot from it, and restore. That's why I never had to do any of those things. Yeah. But one, one of the other things you can do with Time Machine is to not save the operating system files. And that gives you somewhat more space. Oh, speaking of which... Today, it doesn't make as much difference as it Speaking of which, that's a you brought up another good tip. Um, Time Machine, if you don't tell it anything, will back up everything. Well, oh, it's doing a backup right now. Um, if you go to your options, 
there is an exclude feature. So I exclude my Dropbox folder from it. That saves a lot of space. Because I don't need it to back up my Dropbox folder, which is already in the cloud. And I'm paying for the pack wrap feature in case anything gets lost in Dropbox. So I don't waste space in my time machine backups, backing up things I don't need it to back up. So you could drag your applications folder if you didn't want it to back up applications, your system folder, whatever you don't want it to back up, you could tell it. If you're the least bit concerned of not knowing what to tell it to exclude, let it back up everything. Don't mess with this. <laughs> but if there are things you say that I know I don't need it to back up because I've got a million other copies of it, then you can drag it into here and say exclude. Yes? Will that include any external drives that are plugged into your machine? Automatically? Yes, automatically ex external drives are excluded. And you can tell it to include them or not. Okay, so that's another option I forgot to mention in Time Machine. Any other Time Machine, crash plan, backup, storage, before I talk about one more thing? Well, I can sound stupid, but I have a That's why we're all here. Yes. Okay. Yep. No. Okay, so um, part of the meeting is to talk about just external storage in general. Now, we've been, we spent 90% of it on um, uh, backing up, but your internal drive is a fixed size, whatever it is. Half terabyte, terabyte, two terabytes, whatever it is, you may run out of room on it. That's why they make external drives. So you have a choice. At the, at the point where your internal drive is no longer big enough for what you do, you can either A, replace it with a bigger one, or B, simply plug in an external and use the external for things. So she mentioned that she has her Aperture photo library on an external hard drive. And is that stupid? And I'm like, well, no. It's, you can have anything you want on any drive you want. So if you decided that you don't want that tying up your internal drive or you don't need it on your internal drive, why not put it on an external, as long as that external is also being backed up? Now, what about archiving? This is the topic that we rarely ever talk about. Archiving is, I, let's say I, I, I'm a graphic designer. I worked on a client's file January last year. Delivered, paid, done. Clients not asking for any more, no more revisions, done. How long do I keep that project? And where? That's archiving. So, I have my own theory of what archiving is, and you can differ, beg to differ any way you want. To me, archiving is, I don't want that project that I'm most likely never going to open again to tie up space on my main drives. So back in the day, a lot of people archived to a CD-ROM or a DVD or some other kind of physical media. At one point, I started archiving two external hard drives until I realized that after so long, if you don't use an external hard drive, don't plug it in, don't use it for a while, it could become toast or not bootable or not usable. So I've lost like entire archives of projects because the external drive that I was putting them on wasn't being used regularly enough and it just eventually died. But my theory of what an archive is, is something that I'm most likely never going to use again. Don't want to quite throw it away just yet, but if I lost it, I wouldn't care. So when that archive drive died, it really didn't cause me any grief because there was stuff I was probably never going to open again anyway. And I never cared that, of that stuff, whatever it was that was on it, because I never needed it again. So you have to think about at what point do you throw things away? And at what point do you try and archive things? And how? Because now we're talking about maintaining, again, some other kind of storage that you may argue needs to be backed up or not. But then how are you going to, how are you going to do that? We've become 
less concerned with that because the price of drives have come way down. Before, you were very conscious about what was on your hard drive because your hard drive was, again, a fixed size, and if you ran out of space, it would cost you a lot of money to buy more. Now it costs you virtually nothing to buy more. So we keep more stuff. So just food for thought of what you think about archiving. Um, my archiving basically became my Drobo. My Drobo. Because I can always add more space. Just plug in a bigger drive. I have yet to run out of space because it's just so vast. I think I've got five, three terabyte drives in it. It's like, I don't know what that equates to, but it's so many terabytes that I've yet to hit the wall. It's about 10. Okay, so 10 terabytes, and I'm probably using four or five of it. So I've got a long time before that runs out. And if it does, I'll probably just take out the three, plug in a six or whatever's out at the time, and not think about it anymore. So archiving is not as big of a deal as it used to be, but at some point you've got to decide, do you really need to keep all this old stuff? These old documents that you're probably never going to open again. So something to think about. And if that archive happens to have your family historical pictures in it? Well, I don't consider pictures an archive because archiving is something I'm not going to open again. Pictures I'm always going to want to be able to open. Well... Yeah, I'm not so concerned about me opening. I'm more concerned about my successors. Okay. For me, they're an archive, but for them, they're a live resource. All right. Any other questions? If you have a large uh, time machine backup mm -hmm. or medium size, let's say, and it gets to be full, it starts to shed some of the old documents. Is there any reason why you can't just disconnect that time machine back up and put another one in, continue on, let's say, and of course you have to reboot it, but down, sure. down the road, I've got some stuff on this old time machine. Well, machine. what you just described is another way to archive. It's fine. Another way to archive. So what he just said was... Let me take my question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, the question becomes, if I know I've got some stuff on that old time machine back up, can I merely plug that old time machine back up again and go back into that? Sure. How long will it last, though? You just sit it sure stack. Okay. Because if you don't, you know you're going to start with Right. So his initial question was, let's say you have a one terabyte drive using time machine, starts to fill up. Rather than let it start deleting things, unplug it. Plug in a new one, a new drive. Let Time Machine start over on that new drive. So now he's got his old drive of whatever was on it for all the months, weeks, whatever that was on it. And then he later decides he wants to restore something from that drive. Can he simply later in the future plug that drive in and do a restore? And the recommendation was before you do that, turn off the automatic backup first so it doesn't start deleting things the minute you plug it in. And the answer is yes. Time Machine will see whatever Time Machine drive you've ever used and let you restore from it. And how long will it? How long will the physical gone? drive last? I, again, that's the problem I ran into is that I had this drive that eventually died because uh, I wasn't using it regularly. So if there's one thing you have to consider is will the current operating system that you're trying to access talk to that drive? Oh, yeah. Sometimes that won't happen. But one favor you have, you don't have to use the time machine program. To access that older drive because you can just go into the finder. Okay. So basically, what he's saying is if I just plug it in, don't let Time Machine back up to it, I can just go in and grab stuff out of the folders. So, does that mean that in that case, you are actually using the time machine drive and therefore not letting it die from lack of <laughs> Yes. But you're not using it regularly because you're not going to plug it in every day to pull, pull something off of it. How would you search for a particular file? How would you search for a particular file on Time Machine? The same way you search anything else because when you bring up Time Machine, there is Spotlight. Do you have to do anything special if you 
Okay. Okay. Do I have to do anything special to use what I'm doing, which is having two or more time machines, backups? All you have to do is go into your system preferences, go to time machine, and there will be an option to add a new disk. So plug in the new disk and add it to time machine, and time machine will start using that disk, as well as the ones it was already using. In the back. You, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. I'm glad you said that. The answer to your question is yes, but I'm glad you brought that topic up. The question was, does Time Machine delete its own files? In other words, if I plug in a drive, use it for Time Machine, and I copy a folder onto it myself, and Time Machine starts running out of space and starts wanting to delete things, will it touch the folder I manually put on there, or will it only delete the things that Time Machine put on it? So the answer to her question is, yes, Time Machine will only delete its backups. It won't touch the folder I manually copy to it. But the question that, and this is the point I brought up, I wanted to bring up, don't be cheap. Don't buy an external drive and say, oh my God, it's four terabytes. I can use it for Time Machine. And I've still got two terabytes of stuff I can just throw on there. Because that two terabytes of stuff you're throwing on there is what? Not backed up. So when you buy a drive, to use for Time Machine, you are dedicating it to Time Machine. Do not start putting other things on it. Uh, Terry, because they're not backed up. Terry, I'll give you a, a use case. If you're using Fusion or Parallels and running a Windows VM, mm -hmm. you generally exclude the VM files from the Time Machine backup. But you can use a finder copy of that package to your time machine drive as convenient places as backup targets. And if that drive dies? Then your backup is dead. But you well, still have to... Where did the VM go then that was on it too? Say again? Where did the VM file go on that was on it also? When that so drive you died? You back up the VM there manually. Yeah. It's just to it. use the VM from there. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So you're using the drive as a, again, a backup. I, what I'm, that's different than what I'm saying. I'm saying don't use that drive to store single copies of things on it. Working copies. Working copies. Right. That's not what you're saying. You're saying it's still a backup. Yes. And that works very well to keep the time, time machine from growing because of the... You know, Agreed. But it's still, uh, that's, we're talking two different things, but go ahead. Uh, the second one was when you were talking about your super drive. Yep. You said you had three Yes. What is the reason for that? Okay. So the three partitions are, uh, is this done so I can plug it back in? Yes, it is. Okay, so my last backup, again, was to this external, which I can now unplug. Eject. Okay, first of all, you'll notice on my desktop that there are two icons. I only have one hard drive in here. So that's two partitions of the same drive. Why do I have two partitions? One is called hard disk, hard drive, Macintosh HD, whatever you like to call your hard drive, and that's the one you're used to. That's the one that contains your operating system, your applications, your documents, your user folders, and everything else. I make an external, I'm sorry, a, a, a additional partition for one reason and one reason only. Because I use my computer as one, two, three different identities. I have a Terry White identity that's just me personally working every day as Terry White. I have a Mac Group identity that I'm signed into right now for the Mac Group meetings and Mac Group work. And I have an Adobe identity, so when I'm on the road doing demos for Adobe. I want a, a piece of storage that all of those identities can access that's not permissions-based. When you plug in an external drive, you can turn off permissions on that drive. Anything can write to it, read from it, without any kind of permission issues. The way I get around that with one internal drive is to simply partition it, and on that partition, 
I tell it to ignore ownership on this volume. So that means any one of those three users can write to it, read from it, edit files, update files, do anything on those files without, hey, Terry White owns this, but Adobe doesn't. So Adobe can't modify this because Terry White, I don't want to have to deal with any of that. So I partition my drive for that reason. So that means that when I do a super duper backup, I partition the backup so that it can back up each partition separately too. Now there's a third partition here that because this drive's bigger than this drive. And it's just a third partition just to carry extra stuff. Again, I know it's not backed up. I'm okay with that. It's just random stuff I'm carrying. It's okay if I lose it. So that's why this one's got three on it. So you have to tell it, you have to say that this partition yes. is partition. Yes, correct. So when I plug this in, and I normally... Um, Oh, yeah, I do do a super duper. I was going to say I don't, but I do. So when I plug this one in, you're going to see three icons pop up on the external. This one matches this one. This one matches this one. And this is just left over. Random stuff. That if I lost, I wouldn't care. How do you partition? With disk utility. So in disk utility, the question was, how do you partition? With disk utility, um, you, you, of course, it's going to, well, not, not anymore. It's going to say it's wipe the drive, but it doesn't have to do that anymore. Uh, partition is basically going, you're going to select the drive, you're going to go to the partition, you're going to tell it how big to make, how many, and how big to make each partition. And when it's done, you will have as many volumes as you told it to make. And it's still one hard drive. You can do that without erasing the whole drive now? Now you can, but you still back it up first in case it doesn't work or fails, or dies, or you lose power, or act of God, or some other mishap happens in the middle of partitioning. It depends on what it is you're trying to change, too. Right. It depends on also how much room you have, too. Hmm? How do you unpartition the drive? How do you drive? You would delete the partition. So you'd select it and say, remove it. You want to solve it then? Yeah. Sure. I'm not saying the obvious stuff. <laughs> uh, recently, Western Digital uh, came up with a new series of products called uh, MyCloud. Four terabyte, two terabyte, one terabyte. It comes with an Ethernet port, a USB 3 port. I think it comes with a USB 3 port. And um, so, have you had any experience using that? The idea is, is that you now can take a drive attached to your uh, wireless network and not be able to access it from other places. Good. So his question was, uh, Western Digital and probably other companies are coming out with these drives now that they're calling them cloud drives. So basically, it's an external hard drive. Plug into your computer but it has software to allow you to access those files over the internet. Basically, you're creating your own cloud instead of storing your data on someone else's servers. Uh, have I had any experience with those drives? No. The reason I haven't had any experience with those drives because I solved that problem a long time ago with Mac OS X server. I can already access my files on my server over the cloud from somewhere else. But for someone that doesn't want to get into set, setting up a file server, that is an option to grab one of those drives and try it. I don't know if they're Mac compatible, how compatible they are. I haven't researched that at all. So um, since you reminded me that I had multiple partitions and that, yes, they need to also be super duper, thanks. I'm doing the other one that's important that I hadn't done in ages. But it's still backed up. I just hadn't added it to this. Yes? The purchase of regular drives to be used as externals, uh, is there a particular grade drives that you would invest in or they don't grade them, they speed them? But there are, no, aren't there drives that are like... They're server class server is what he's class, referring to. Yeah, but you won't want to buy those anyway. Which is either crazy. <laughs> I haven't seen any failure Anywhere. All right. 
Yes. Her question was, uh, does she remember correctly that in Super Duper you had the option of cloning to a disk image? Yes. And where would you put it? Wherever you want. So yes, and wherever you want. Yeah, except on the drive that you're copying from, obviously. So Okay, question was, if the size is right, would it be viable to burn to a DVD? No, because I don't know of anyone that has only a 4 gig hard drive, and that's all a D or 8 gig hard drive, that's all a DVD is going to hold, so I don't see the DVD option. By the way, speaking of failures, I've had more optical failures than anything else in history, so I never trust putting anything long-term on a CD or DVD ROM. If you wait, if you want to lose something, put it on a DVD. <laughs> Eventually, that DVD will not be readable. I, I have to tell this story because it, you know, going through my stuff, I have a club Mac drive that I bought maybe 10, 12 years ago. It was all of six or eight gigabytes or gigabytes, megabytes. The thing weighs five or six pounds, a great big. And I just out of curiosity, I plugged it in and went to buy. So I guess the, my point is that drives uh, I don't know. Luck of the draw. It's not good for you. It's gambling. It's too small, but I guess my point is I've very almost never had a drive. You had so many no, I'm just saying, congratulations. You're one of the few. Yeah. Uh, just, a, just a couple of quickies. Um, if you think about what your data's worth in business costs, Thank you. or your time loss to recover it, or the loss of history, or the emotional loss when you blow away the pictures that you took for your wife or your husband or whatever, um, you got to remember your data is only worth the effort you take to take care of that data. The backup is just part of it. Um, the other thing is that on UPS is if anybody has specific issues with batteries at UPS, they can talk to me if they want to. Okay. Now this super duper only took four minutes, four and a half minutes, because again it was only doing an update of what was already on that drive and not a whole lot changes on that particular um, partition. So it took four minutes to back up um, whatever had changed and now both of these drives are mirrored perfectly onto both of these drives. So I can now eject these. You can't choose to move to a single partition though, right? Sure you can. So each one you can have multiple partitions with different systems on it and choose which one you want to boot from. Yep. Go ahead. Jerry, is, is, I may be dating myself. Is file fragmentation still an issue in Macintoshes? And if I were to do a super duper backup, would it lay the files down in order rather than fragment it? I know from the disk image. Is how it Most people will argue that with the Unix OS, uh, OS 10 that you don't have to deal with file fragmentation as much as you used to. Um, and actually, defragging might slow it down <laughs> as opposed to making it better. Others will argue the other way. Um, I haven't defragged a drive in probably 10 years. Only a new clone will lay down unfragmented files. Okay. File 